The new Mantis X10 Fire Amp's performance system has all the goodness of the original, plus holster draw analysis and recoil analysis. It's a fantastic upgrade and I recommend it highly. Hey guys, Brian Hill, Complete Combatant. Uh, this is your Mantis Dry Fire Mondays exercise video. We're gonna get into the land of self-defense a little bit and how we can improve that in our dry practice. And this is a really important part because most gun handling is administrative in nature, but there's an area where we go from being not ready to ready to shooting. We need to cover those in our practice and make sure that we have some throttle response controls to the dangerousness of the situation. And that's why we really want to do it. There's, um, this is a, this is going to be a tough one. Some of you guys aren't going to like what I have to say on this. Um, you have limited practice time. This is not your profession and you have to make the most out of it. And you have to have something that will serve you well on the street. So remember, as an armed citizen, your primary goal is to get home safely, all right? If you were in the military, you would be looking to close with the enemy and destroy them. If you're in law enforcement, you would seek to arrest them and take them in for the court to decide their fate. But we're just armed citizens and we're going to carry a concealed weapon, but we need some modulation because the flat range is not like the real world. Uh, there are people walking around everywhere we go. Uh, we live in buildings with multiple floors and there are directions that are safe and not safe to do certain things. And you have to be thinking the whole time about what is real dangerous for you to do. So it's contextual, the context of the environment. What is going on around you has to help you make these decisions. So don't take the advice of how a law enforcement officer did it. Don't take the advice of how a military guy did it. Think about what's going to be necessary for you, the armed citizen, because you're the one that's going to pay the consequences if you just take somebody's advice without exploring it. One of my great advantages in my life is that I teach force on force constantly to armed citizens. So I have this great bank of watching people do things under a tremendous amount of stress and, and a skill level that's relative to the armed citizen. And that's very helpful as an instructor. So almost all my teachings are geared backwards. It's from the person out. I don't really care so much about the gun part of it. I care about how you psychologically react to danger, physiologically react, and then technical or biomechanical skills that will allow you to make the best choices in the context available to you. All right, so I've got my new HKP30 long slide here. It is clear, I'm gonna clear it again. I have a magazine here. It's got dummy rounds in it. I'm going to insert it into the gun. I'm going to run the decocker and put my hand over the thumb, uh, over the hammer, my thumb over the hammer. I'm going to slowly and reluctantly do it. Now, the great thing about having a hammer fire gun is nothing can move that hammer. So the gun can't fire. It's really safe. Uh, I also have been exploring a new holster set up with this one. And I found that the belt is really key for hiding this. I've got wedges and claws on it, but I had to go to a much thicker belt with this gun. It's very thin, but it tends to stick out on the edges. So really working on that. Of course, having overhead lighting shows every bit of flaw that you have in your concealment rig. Now, let's talk about ready positions. The ready means that you are prepared to do something. Doesn't mean you're doing it. It means you're prepared to do something. So. Uh, a lot of positions get brought up in this. We have temple index, we have sewel, we have compressed ready, we have high ready, we have low ready, we have compressed low ready. They all have advantages and tremendous disadvantages with each of them. There's no perfect thing. For me as the armed citizen, I need to have primarily two readies, either one down or one up. I live in a three-story building, so sometimes down is good, sometimes up is good. I'm in a basement, down is always good. All right, there's just ground underneath me. But if I'm on the top floor, down is very bad. So the context change because I'm in a different location. So uh, if I like low ready, but there's a bunch of children running around, it's not a suitable position to have to use, all right? But if I like high ready and there's people directly above me, it's not suitable then either, okay? That could be at the next level. So I have to think about what's gonna be suitable for my use of force. Uh, a big nod to Masada Yu, uh, we need to use CYA. Can you articulate and can you authenticate? It's very important that your thinking is going to be clear. Uh, most people don't have a clear process of why they would do something, so they're going to find it very hard to explain themselves. Remember, we're all bound by the law. Whether you know it or not, the law still binds you, and you have to be able to take actions that are based upon what the law will allow you to do. In my state, uh, showing a gun is not a penalty. In some states, that's called brandishing a weapon. 
Uh, I could show the gun, but if I point the gun at somebody, it becomes aggravated assault, which is significant. That's a felony. So I'm going to have some in-between areas. And what this is, means is uh, my skill sets may be better than most people, so I've seen some danger in advance and I have a greater bit of distance. Uh, you know, we know the Tula principle, uh, the distance that people can cover. Uh, uh, 21 feet is very limited distance for most people to be able to do anything. So uh, a ready position allows me to get ahead of that and be ready for danger so that I don't have to come out of the holster. Now, I don't want to bring my gun out until I absolutely know there's no other choice. And this means I'm getting really close to that decision to shoot. Maybe I have some cover between me. Um, maybe there's a barrier between them and me. Uh, maybe they haven't decided all the way yet and they're going to watch me. What I need to communicate is that I am a resolute warrior, that I'm willing to use force to defend my life and the loves, the lives of the loved ones around me, but also that I'm willing to give my own life in that. Um, many people are willing to kill, but not many people are willing to die for things. And in interviews with criminals, you hear that quite frequently. The, I think William April brought this up. What are you willing to die for? There's not a whole lot. So you have to communicate that as a good person, the sacrifice is there and you're willing to engage. So your, your confidence, your posture will communicate that, but also skillful handling of the tool. If you're fumbling at the tool and you're very uncomfortable with it, you're going to make somebody make a different decision because they know that you're not quite competent. And that could be that you may accidentally do something wrong or that they could take it away from you. So we wanna get good at skillful handling this. That's why I recommend these two positions and I hope they'll serve you well. I know there's many others, but these two are easy for you to put into your practice. All right, I'm gonna make it a dry fire practice, okay? So I have three draws that I practice constantly. Uh, two of these have verbal commands with them because it's very hard to talk with the gun in your hand. Uh, most people, if you're a good talker, um, then gun handling skills go away. If, you, if you're quiet by nature, you may be able to handle a gun, but you may not be able to talk. So we want to start stacking these cognitive skills so they become unconsciously competent in our brain that we can do them almost automatically. And that way we can keep our mind open to watch the danger and to make the decision to shoot instead of being caught up in what we're saying, how our feet are moving, where the gun goes, how our hands are doing it. That all take a lot of bandwidth away from what's really important, watching the person's hands and making the decision whether you need to use force or not. So from the draw, I'm gonna check the gun again. It's been in my holster, didn't go anywhere, it's still empty. There's a tripod in the room with me, there's a camera and there's nobody else, so everyone's safe. I'm gonna point the gun at you. Remember, bullets don't come through cameras. Okay, so this would be a high position for me. I'm not a big fan of this because it blocks my eye line can't see their hands very well right here. So I want to be able to see their hands. The gun is pointed up. Now, you know, if you go to some ranges or if you engage in some competition shooting things, this would be over the berm and it would be illegal. So let's practice in dry practice right now. So the gun is up from here. This becomes the extended prep and press when I make the decision to shoot. I simply move my finger to the trigger, drive the gun and the sights to the target and shoot. That's a great drill. Mike Sieglander is the one that introduced me to that. The extended prep and press. So I'm moving from here to here. It takes about a half second for most people, sometimes three quarters of a second, which is quicker than their draw. The other one may be that I'm going to point slightly down and off sides. That would be a low ready. This is not as popular as it once was, but for the armed citizen, it's very simple. And the transition is very quick, very quick. You can just move the gun right to the target. But if somebody was close to me, it's harder to defend it out here. I, of course, can go to a low compressed ready like this and then move the gun up. That becomes more like the extended prep and press from a low position. Now, some people call this a ready position, but as you're looking at the camera, the muzzle is pointing at you, okay? So this is not a ready position. This is a shooting position, okay? All I have to do is I'm ready to shoot you. The gun's pointing at you. You know, one of those safety rules is keep your finger off the trigger and don't muzzle anything you're not willing to destroy. I haven't made the decision to shoot yet, so there's no reason for this gun to be pointing at you. There are three shooting positions that I teach, all right? This is the retention position. This would be very close fighting inside hand-to-hand -hand grappling distance. This would be the compressed position, double arms length, and extension would exceed double arms length, okay? Remember, as if you're in law enforcement, you're always gonna have to get close to the guy to see what's going on. We don't have to, if we can keep somebody at distance, it's good for us. So let's practice in a dry practice scenario. We're gonna have three draws, all right? 
So the first one I'm going to draw to the high ready and issue a verbal command. Okay. I've got my hands up. I draw it here. Hey, get away from me. Get back. Show me your hands. Nothing happened. He's ran away. So I'm going to hook my thumb over the hammer and I'm going to slowly and reluctantly holster the gun. Okay. Next one, I'm going to draw right to the target. This is a decision to shoot. But right here, I'm going to use the low ready to slow myself down. I'm going to relax a little bit. It may not be time to put the gun away yet, but if it is, I want to do that slowly and reluctantly, like Tom Gibbons says. Careful right here. The hammer blo is blocked by my thumb, so I feel incredibly safe with that. The last one is to a low ready. Show me your hands! Back up now! And then I can move to here if I wanted to shoot, or I'm going to come back to this position, and I'm going to slow down for a second, and then put the gun away. Here's something a lot of people miss, and some of you will believe that this could never happen to you, but there's some really good science. Check out Four Science Institute on this. There's a thing called trigger checking or trigger verification. And what happens to people under extreme pressure, not when you're comfortable, not when you're doing what you like, but extreme pressure and fear, force on force brings this out all the time, is their finger will move to the trigger to make sure it's still there. It's an unconscious habit. That means it requires no conscious thought to do it, okay? One of the reasons I carry a double action gun is for this, not the heaviness of the pull, but for the distance my finger has to move. And it allows me some awareness of motion instead of just touching. Very light triggers are dangerous in that, that regard because you can just touch them. So if I'm here and I'm issuing verbal commands and I'm moving my feet and I'm talking, this is what happens to people. Their finger does this. Very skilled people in, in the video analysis for science did this. So don't think you're immune to it. Uh, I spend a lot of time with a gun and I don't think I'm immune to it. So make sure that's a part of it. What I'd suggest is you dry practice is film yourself and see if you ever touch the finger and you're not aware of it. Uh, just the mere filming of some action requires you to pay attention more and it creates a bit of pressure, which is very good for you. So three draws, there's nothing above me, everything's safe. Okay, fingers straight to the ready. And then I either go to extended prep and press or I put the gun away. Okay, now I'm gonna draw straight to the target, prepping the trigger and being ready to shoot, come back, finger comes off the trigger and back to this position. I'm gonna draw to the low ready, okay? Get back, get away from me now, show me your hands. I could either go to the shooting or I can bring it back in and bring it back. I'm practicing a lot of skills there at once. Make sure you're not touching the trigger. Make sure you can articulate. One thing with the low ready is I tend to sit, pick something where I would point the gun if I know I'm gonna draw to that, and that's where it'd go. Claude Warner's done a lot of work on this. A lot of defensive gun uses simply stop at the point that the gun is shown and the person shows a willingness to use force. And then the other person runs away. Of course, it's a lot harder to get statistics on this, right? Because it's not interesting, somebody just ran away. Oftentimes, the bad guy will call the police on you. You need to be able to articulate and authenticate what you did and why you did it, all right? There were three guys that were around my car. One of them showed me a knife. He said, get over here, I'm going to kill you and take your car. I drew the gun, told him to get away, and they all decided to leave at that point. For the armed citizen, it may be a good idea you know, to make the first call. I don't know, I'm not an attorney. I'm not suggesting that I've done a lot of legal courses, but realize that the bad guy may very well call on you. And then you'll have to defend yourself as not the victim, but somebody who's got a complaint filed against him. Think about that and be able to do this. Remember, you win 100% of the fights you don't get in. It's really important to keep that in mind. We're trying to deselect ourselves through competence, confidence, and skillful gun handling. All right, guys, thanks for tuning in. I'm Brian Hill with The Complete Combatant. Uh, my tag is, uh, Instagram is uh, Chief Chaos Controller because that's what I do. I work with chaos a lot. If you want to get better at these things, remember you need to measure, refine, and perform. I'll see you guys next time, and let me know how your practice is going. Thank you so much.